If you're listening on podcast, be sure to tune in to our YouTube channel for more content. The link is in the description. Welcome to Wild and Weird Radio, a Wild and Weird West Virginia podcast. In the southern part of Pennsylvania, in an area known as the Laurel Highlands, the westernmost portion of the Allegheny Mountains rise and extend across 75 miles, pushing their way toward northern West Virginia, where they disappear into a series of hills to shy of Morgantown. This ridge is commonly referred to as the Chestnut Ridge and has become synonymous with high strangeness. Stories of UFOs, Bigfoot activity, and even flying creatures have been reported in this area for years. A recent investigation by seasoned researchers and a documentary film crew managed to capture some of the strange activity that have been reported in this area, including strange lights and an eerie metallic sound. The strange lights in the woods and weird metallic sounds can be found in several prominent UFO cases and other high strangeness events from around the world, including the most famous of all, the legendary Mothman of Point Pleasant during its initial sightings. These findings have only seemed to validate some of the research that longtime UFO cryptid researcher and investigator Stan Gordon has been documenting for years. Veteran researcher Stan Gordon, Eric Altman, and Tom Miak join us as we probe the high strangeness and weird phenomena that seems to plague the Chestnut Ridge on this episode of Wild and Weird Radio. Welcome back to Wild and Weird Radio, everybody. Thank you for joining us all over the world, quite literally, by the way. So, uh, again, before we get into this week's episode, I feel like we have been doing this basically every week for the last three weeks. This exact phrase, guys, we have a very special episode for you this week, yet again. Yeah. And uh, But before we get into that, remember, if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and like, share, and then, uh, you know, hit the notification bell. That way, every time we have new content coming out, you will be alerted and you'll be able to stay up to date with us in the moment. That way, you never have to miss hearing the soothing sounds of our voice ever again. And uh, if you're listening to us through podcast, make sure you hit the download option as well. That way, you will be downloading the episode as well as listening to the episode. It's basically like a double hit for us, so it helps out tremendously. And uh, remember, like, share, and subscribe on all of those social media accounts. So we're talking Hellbent Holler, Hellbent Jesse, Lanham Ron, Skinwalker Sculpts, all that good stuff. Wild and Weird Radio, obviously. And uh, without further ado, we're going to skip the news desk because this is going to be a packed house episode because we have none other than Eric Altman, Tom Mihawk, and Stan Gordon on the line all of which live in and around the Chestnut Ridge in Pennsylvania. And uh, if you guys have been paying attention to anything that involves high strangeness for the last 40, 50 years, then you have heard about the Chestnut Ridge. And uh, there's been some recent activity going on over the last, well, especially the last few years, but as recent as just this past week, in the last few weeks, there has been activity. We're going to be going over out with these guys, and uh, we can't wait to get into it with all of you. Glad to be here, Joe. Man, it is, uh, Tom, it's, it's great to have you with us. Eric, it is great to have you with us. Jesse, it is great to have you back with us. We've got yes, the gang back, back together. Finally. <laughs> I had survived the Dogman Conference, and I have you, returned. You survived Dogman. You so, came hey, back to so, us. Since you went to the Dogman Conference, uh, and we're not doing the news break update, give us a little bit of uh, feedback from Dogman Conference that you had. Tell us was, just, just it, a few snippets. It was a lot of fun. Um, it went really well. It was presented by Paranormal Roundtable, 
and it was in Paris, Tennessee, and a lot of uh, really cool people spoke, uh, including my new best friend, Barton Nunley. So um, that was a lot of fun. And then after the conference, Joe and I went into the LBL for a little while that night and um, just had a really good time. And then Sunday, we ended up going to the Bell Witch Cave, and uh, we were there for several hours, very, very, very late into the night. So a lot of awesome. interesting stuff happened. Yeah. I'm sure you guys are preparing some content to go along with that. Am I right? We are. Yes, of course. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, you know remember, it. go look up Hellbent Holler on YouTube. Make sure you hit the notification bell over there because, like myself, you are going to be waiting and and just with bated breath to grab a hold of these new videos that they're going to be releasing from the LBL uh, because it's second to none. The content that's coming out out there, it's great. Um, Jesse and Joe are killing it. And uh, it, it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. It really is. Thank you very much. So we're going to be talking about uh, a really strange part of land today, guys. Um, and what's really funny is, you know, uh, the locals know this, but it's just starting to get out there to the rest of the world at this point uh, that you guys uh, live in a very, very, uh, what we call a high strange window of some sort, right? So uh, I think we're going to let Stan kind of fill us in a little bit on that and some of the goings-on that's uh, happening up uh, near the Chestnut Ridge. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll kind of play off of that and figure out some of the, the weird things that you guys have seen, like, recently and talk about that. So, Stan, you want to give him a quick rundown on the Chestnut Ridge? Well, there's... Um... There's always been a long history, of course, of incidents going on along the ridge. Um, I can tell you just in general, uh, not only on the ridge, but here throughout western Pennsylvania, other areas. Uh, the last couple of years, all through last year, all through the fall and winter of 2021, continuing right into 2022, right through the last couple of weeks, it's been just nonstop UFO cases coming in. And a lot of these are really detailed UFO observations. There have been numerous daylight observations some very large solid objects reported, uh, some pretty close to the ground. But what's even much more intriguing to me is that since probably March of this year, we're seeing an increase of what I've been calling many UFOs for years. I started realizing uh, the fact that there were such reports back in the 1960s. And it's been going on more and more. I've um, talked about it. I've lectured on it. I've written about it for years and years. But the incidents that are going on are just incredible. And I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, people can go to my website, stangordon.info, and I, I just put out uh, within the last week a, a large uh, article concerning some of the recent activity. Uh, July 28th, so it's this year, uh, 3 o'clock, a little after 3 o'clock in the morning. So this is outside of Ligonier. So this is between the Chestnut Ridge and the Laurel Ridge. And the witness was awakened, uh, sees a small bright blue ball of light uh, about 8 to 10 feet away. It's about a foot in diameter. The light is self-contained and emitting no external light. And uh, it's just bobbing up and down right in front of the bedroom window. Uh, interesting report. Uh, again, many other reports coming in from all over Western PA. Uh, this just happened uh, about a, little, a couple weeks ago. This is from Greene County. Uh, this came in, I believe, from uh, one of my research associates, Jim Brown, who's investigated some really interesting cases as well up in Fayette County. This was um, after 1030 on August the 9th, and a man happened to look out the window, and he sees this about a 10-inch diameter yellow-white sphere about 20 feet away. And they go to another window. He calls the sun. They go to another window to make sure it's not a reflection. They're both watching this thing. So here's what's really interesting. They grab a, a, a phone camera, and they try to take a picture of it. But when they're looking through the viewfinder, they can only see the surrounding area, like the trees. They can't see the sphere. So they happen to have close by the end, they had um, a, di a regular digital camera. So they grabbed a digital camera looking through the viewer, and once again... They can see the surroundings, but they can see the little sphere. So also by sheer luck, and they, in another room, they found an old SLR film camera, so different technology, and they looked through the viewer, and guess what? They can see both the sphere and the surrounding area, but unfortunately the camera didn't work. 
Uh, so that was kind of interesting. But So these reports are going on and on. Um, a really interesting case that occurred, uh, Jim Brown investigated again, uh, April 6th of this year. This is daylight. Um, and he was on the scene within 45 minutes after it occurred. And uh, this took place um, out in the rural area. And uh, around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, weather conditions uh, were decent. Uh, there was no rain at the time. The wind was mostly calm. And his husband and wife were working out in their yard. And they noticed about 50 feet away, about 10 feet above the fence line, they see this silver circular object about 2 feet in diameter. It's slowly drifting towards them. It's getting closer and closer. At first, they figured it was a mylar balloon. But as it's getting closer, it's getting brighter and brighter. And as it gets quite close to them, all of a sudden, uh, there's like this small little lightning bolt that shoots uh, from the object towards the ground. And it was a, 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 a sound like a small firecracker, like a snap, like a spark. And that spark started a small fire in the field. So the man grabbed his shovel and immediately put that fire out, and they noticed also along the path where it came about 100 feet away, there was other, another small fire as well. But anyhow, at that point, it just was gone. So Jim gets out there, and he's a real high-tech guy with a lot of instruments and whatever. He gets to the scene, and there is no debris whatsoever. If this had been a mylar balloon or been a firecracker, there should have been a lot of debris on the scene. There was absolutely nothing there. So that's just an example of so many reports coming in. I can tell you, over again, over the last few weeks and months, uh, we're getting calls from widespread areas. People are getting these small spheres, these unusual lights on their security cameras, on their game cams. We've had, and what's interesting, they're not just all coming in from wooded areas now. They're coming in now from more populated areas and housing developments where these things, and we have one video of one that uh, the person was a, was uh, made aware that there was something activating their security system. And when they went to look at the video, you can see the small sphere just coming right up on the porch of their house. So some very, very interesting things have been going on. And this is not the norm. I mean, I've, I've gotten a lot of really interesting cases over the years. And we've had some, of course, we had that 1973 wave of UFO and Bigfoot sightings. That's another story. But I've never had this type of activity with these small luminous objects low the ground and approaching very close to people in different areas guys um i, I know in particularly you you two have both seen something very similar to what he's talking about like eric and, and tom um well jesse too jesse's uh and well joe i guess i'm the only one who hasn't seen an orb <laughs> of all the things i have seen this is the one thing i haven't seen and i don't understand that but that's okay um what um i don't know i mean it does kind of seem like this is on the rise we've talked about this before too this, there was actually an episode we did where where these things on the rise is paranormal activity and whatnot um you two were really good witnesses to something similar to this. You want to want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I don't know if you'd want to call them orbs. Um, I would call them lights is what yeah. we've seen. Um, maybe Tom can elaborate more on what he saw because he had a pretty close en encounter with them and they may have been orbs. But what I've saw in this area that we are continuing to investigate are lights and um, they appear to be bright luminescent flashlight beams pointed at us if you were to look directly at a flashlight it has that light that comes off the front of it they're not actually the beam of light you can see itself like looking at it from a side angle but looking directly at a flashlight that's what they look like to me um, the three lights i saw in the forest look like cell phones like if somebody was walking holding the cell phone away from their body facing me but they were blue green in color there were three of them that were bouncing along like Three people were just walking nonchalantly through the woods at night, carrying cell phones, all pointed at me, and they were joined by a fourth red light, and then shortly after they were joined by this fourth red light, they all disappeared. So, wow. I don't know. And this area, if I can take a step back, we've been investigating this area since March, and the reason we were called into this area is because a witness got a hold of us and told us that uh, while she was working one night at a fire station, 
she's a paramedic. Um, she told us that she was hearing screams and high pitched whistles and really strange animal sounds coming off of a wooded hillside across the street. Um, and about maybe a quarter of a mile from the fire station where she works at very late at night. And when she informed of us this of that occurrence, she invited us down to investigate. We went down to talk to her in person and her and her husband agreed to take us into this area, this very wooded area to show us just the area itself. And the night that we were out, um, she had a light anomaly sighting that she described as a bright flash of light that shrunk down to the size of a lightning bug that disappeared. And this was in mid-March before lightning bugs were even out. And her husband at one point thought he had seen some lights in the forest as well. So they seemed to be kind of floating through the trees and then disappeared. So after that event happened, we had some possible Bigfoot activity going on in the same area that night as well. We heard wood knocks. We heard um, things moving around in the forest. We couldn't see anything on the thermal flare, but we could hear something walking, branches snapping. Um, the vehicle that the husband and wife were in, in, the Jeep they were driving in front of us, had something large and heavy thrown at the vehicles. They were exiting the area. So because of that occurrence, we continue to investigate this area. And over the series of weeks, if not months, we've had anomalous activity going on in this area. Almost every time we've gone up there, something strange has happened. And we'll get into it a little bit later, but I sent audio recordings to you guys to analyze that we captured in this particular area. And it's still, for some reason, I don't know what it is, but this area has a lot of the light anomalies um, that we've been discussing. And, and Tom had a personal encounter himself that still leaves him pretty um, stunned, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, we definitely want to get into that. And yeah. you made a good point. Let's call them light anomalies, not orbs, just because there's a differentiation there between the paranormal world. A lot of people think oh, orbs, it's dust. These are not dust. These are no. self-eliminated yeah, points of light, and they yeah. are very, very different. So, yeah, let's use them as light anomalies, uh, and that way, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a different terminology as far as that goes. Well, this, so, if I could interrupt real quick, this might be different from what Stan's talking about. Mm -hmm. Stan's talking about actual orbs, round circles that are being seen in the day and nighttime. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing light anomalies. And I don't know, to me, like I said, they don't look like orbs. They right. look like light. Points so of light, this might right? Be, yeah, this yeah. might be something different than what, we're, what Stan's talking about. It could be. So, Tom, uh, tell us a little bit about your encounter and and how that experience was for you, as well as uh, what kind of effect it had on your body in the moment you were having it. I'm, I'm interested in hearing that. Sure. Uh, well, let me start by saying it, it wasn't the first time that I've seen light anomalies up on the ridge. Um, even as long as a year ago when Eric, myself, and Ricky Cherby were out up in a different area of the ridge, uh, you know, Ricky and I had seen balls of light, spheres of light, you know, whatever you want to refer to them as. Again, just like you guys said, I don't like calling them orbs because that sounds too much of an association with what paranormal investigators call orbs. And these definitely are not uh, bugs or dust reflections or anything like that. Um, these lights that we're seeing um, or illuminating from from themselves, you know. It, in other words, like when Eric made the reference about how, like, it looked like a flashlight. You know, if somebody's holding a flashlight, you can see that little light trail that goes up to the to the circle of light. These don't have it. Uh, I mean, these seem to be self illuminating. Um, I mean, you know, having said that, um, the, the balls of light or the spheres of light, whatever you want to call them that I saw in April. Uh, we were at this uh, this particular area that Eric was talking about, and uh, myself and a few other people were standing in a little clearing, uh, probably about 50 yards away from a little cemetery tucked up on the hillside. And down this long road, I, Eric, I don't know what you'd say, the road may be about, what, four or 500 yards from where we were to the up to the road where it connects where you guys were? It's about three quarters of a mile. Okay. So 
uh, that night, uh, Eric and a few people were up around the corner down this road and kind of off to the right, so not in a direct line of sight to us. Uh, you know, several people that night had seen lights. They had seen flashes of lights in the trees. I had seen two baseball-sized crystal blue colored balls or spheres of light in the tree line along this road earlier in the evening. Um, but at one point, we, we all saw two lights halfway down the road, probably a good 200 yards or whatever it is from us. One was white to an orangish color, probably about the size of a cantaloupe. The other was a a very dark reddish color sphere of light and that one was more the size of a basketball it was about two or three times the size of the of the smaller sphere of light um you know we couldn't figure out what it was everybody's kind of startled by it so i started walking down the road um trying to move towards it every time i moved towards it they seemed to come towards me as well so as I'm walking down the road, I really thought it was somebody from the other group. Somebody maybe had a camera on some type, something equipment wise that had lights on it. I, I, you know, couldn't figure out what it was. I got to within about five, maybe seven or eight feet of the lights. And, and, and this road, to, to step back a second, this is completely dark. I mean, there's no ambient light. It, it was pitch black without a flashlight. If these lights hadn't have been there, I wouldn't have been able to see my way down the road. So when I got about five, seven feet from them, still thinking it might be somebody from the other group, I started to ask, you know, who is it? As soon as I spoke, both lights disappeared. I had a flashlight in my hand that was not on. As soon as the lights disappeared, I turned the flashlight on and there was nothing around me at all i mean it was nobody from the group uh I, yeah and i mean he about stunned i'd seen lights before but never that close so i i was a little bit shaken because you know you always hear the lore of the stories about the spook lights the ghost lights and they draw you in and everything else and it didn't be until i was talking to somebody days later but i thought well, what if i hadn't spoke would I have actually come in contact with them? What were they? And it started to make me think a little bit more in depth about what it was we were seeing. Then. Because there was, and Eric can, can elaborate on this as well, there was a lot of other phenomenon going on that night as well. All throughout the night, not only were we seeing lights from different areas and angles, but we were hearing little metallic uh wind chime like sounds within the tree lines that seemed to be responding to us um you know we did have some a couple of howls or you know uh unidentifiable whoops or you know whatever it was we had a number of things going on that night the lights just seemed to take center stage so <clears throat> when you were you were that close to this this ball of light now in the encounter that we had had doing some filming a while back um it it was maybe i don't know 50 feet from us whenever it darted off over the ridge line and you're saying that you saw it um did, did it disappear like it just the light turned out or did it dart off no it just disappeared Okay. It was almost like somebody hit the switch to off, and then they were just gone. And, you know, again, I mean, I, I turned the flashlight on right away. There, yeah. there wasn't residual light. There was no noise. There was no smell. Um, you know, nothing other than that light. Even when the lights were present, there was no sound whatsoever. You know, and... Of course, we were all out there. We were trying to be quiet. So, again, I'm thinking all up until the time they disappeared, I'm thinking it's got to be somebody from the other group. They're walking down. They weren't making noise like I was trying to be quiet. And then the minute I physically spoke, the minute I went audible, the, the little cantaloupe-sized orange or 
whitish colored sphere of light and the larger basketball size that was dark red, the minute I became audible, they just vanished. They didn't wow. dissipate. They didn't dart off. They just weren't there anymore. Wow. And it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's just amazing. Uh, Tom, those lights. Now, Eric's seems to be more of like a, a pinpoint of light. Yours almost sounds like what Stan had described as as an actual orb of some, not uh, there's the word again, but I'm a sphere. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like right. an actual sphere of light, right? I mean, that's what the ones that I saw close up were definitely spheres. What they were made of, what their origins were, no clue. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, I, you know, and. When I think about it, when I think back to that night, I don't interpret them as a UFO or a UAP. Uh, I mean, I honestly don't know what they were. Maybe they were that. But, you know, I, you know, I, I'm speechless about it, really. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to put into words because, you know, you see stuff like that from a distance. And, you know, that's, uh, that's astonishing enough. But when you get that close... You know, I, I just I wish I had an answer. I wish I had some type of working theory, but I, I I mean I can't come up with anything. And Eric and I have seen lights together before that night and after that night, and you know again just just no explanation as to what they could be. So you mentioned um, that there was a, the lights were also accompanied by a metallic sound as well as howling. Um, I'm starting to get reports more and more that all of these things are happening together. Is this the first time that you've experienced all three of these phenomenon together? No, um, not with the, the metallic sounds. That's the first time we had it with the metallic sounds. Now, Tom mentioned earlier that he had saw lights in a different location on the ridge about a year, maybe a year prior. Um, we had some yeah. whoops that happened at that location and they had seen the lights after the whoop sounds, but it it was during that, that evening, but we'd never heard any metallic sounds. This is the only location I've personally been to where we've had possible Bigfoot activity going on, um, strange metallic or metal. It almost sounds like if you take a fork and hit, hit a beer bottle with it, an empty beer bottle, that, that clink yeah. type of sound. And I like it. a wedding. Okay. Yeah, and then these lights. And um, they're not exactly pinpoint, Ron, just to, to clarify. They're not pinpoint lights in the distance. These are big, bright lights, like LED flashlights that are close. And we actually, Tom and I just had the same experience where we saw a white and a red light on that same road. But we were in the op coming the opposite direction. And if you want me to share that with you real quick, I can. But that happened just like, sure. what, two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. We were back in this area and doing investigations and i decided to walk up that road by myself in the dark and i got maybe uh, i'd say maybe 100 maybe 125 yards away from the rest of the group that were in this clearing at the bottom of the hill from the cemetery and there were four other people in that group five other people in that group and tom was included in that group i got about 100 125 yards away from the group because i just wanted to walk this road myself and i stopped and tom walked up and joined me and as Tom and I were standing there talking, uh, we noticed someone coming towards us up the road as well. And a few minutes later, we can out talking back and forth on radio with the other group. We can out make the outline of my son walking towards us. And he had a thermal flare in his hand and we could see the light coming off the thermal flare, but that's the only external light source he had. And all of a sudden this high powered flashlight shines at us and, and he's only maybe 25, 30 yards away from us, a bright white flashlight beam shines at us, and then a second smaller LED bright red light flashes at us. And it looks like two people are walking towards us with sh flashlights aiming at us. Then all of a sudden they stop, the red light sets down on the ground like somebody put an LED light on the ground itself, and both lights went out. And we started walking towards my son, Josh, and asked him if he had a flashlight, and he didn't. And he did not see any lights at all. He was just looking around with the thermal flare. And we thought, okay, well, maybe it's somebody from the group being that we're only about 125 yards away. So we, we tried to do tests with the group, having them flash flashlights at us. And it looked absolutely nothing like what we had seen. 
So where these two sources of light came from, we have no idea. Tom, do you want to add to that? Um, well, the only thing, well, not to that particular event. I mean, you covered pretty much everything, but I, the one thing that I want to go back to or just to you know, mention again is, like Eric said, where I saw the two spheres of light in April and where we saw those two lights a few weeks ago, um, it's on the same stretch of road. It's it's on the same, it's, it's probably within the same 100 to 150 yards of this road. And then the last time we were out there, Eric and I, well, Eric saw it first. I caught just a glimpse of it. But Eric saw lights right off that road in the tree line. And it was right on that same stretch of road. Now, you know, why we're continually seeing them on that stretch of road, you know, who knows, but uh, for whatever reason, you know, when we, when Eric and I saw the lights between him and his son, and I saw the lights in April, they were both the same colors, you know, different sizes and on a different spot on that road coming from a different direction, but same colored lights. So, you know, it's kind of baffling as to why it seems to be concentrated in that one little area, but hard to say. I'm curious to what Stan's thoughts are on this coinciding phenomenon with the howling and the metallic sound and the lights and if he's experienced any of that. Yeah, Stan, have you experienced any, uh, any relations between uh, the howling phenomena, the lights and this metallic sound that's uh, been reported? I read, I read about some of this in my solid invasion book about that massive 1973-1974 UFO Bigfoot outbreak here in Pennsylvania. When That's when I began to realize that there was a lot of strange aspects of the Bigfoot phenomena that we weren't looking for. That's when we had those strange reports, whether we liked it or not, with UFOs and Bigfoot seen together. But one of the things that I talked about back there was the fact that some witnesses – who were in areas where there was Bigfoot activity, where Bigfoot had been seen, they were reporting this strange metallic sound, uh, sometimes like uh, metal tearing, metal on metal. So I heard about that years ago. Uh, what it is and how it's related to it, I do not know. Um, but, yeah, sometimes when these this phenomena, whatever it is, you know, as I mentioned before, you can have a Bigfoot sighting almost anywhere. We have many reports of these things walking out in front of people's cars over the years in daylight as well as at night. But whatever is going on more and more is as though this phenomena is focusing or targeting on more specific geographical locations. And some of these places have a long history of all kind of phenomena from paranormal in, uh, incidents occurring to Bigfoot sightings, other cryptid accounts, UFO sightings. Uh, the small orbs of light, all kind of strange things going on. But l let me give you a little, a little more information on what I found out about whatever these objects are. Mm -hmm. And whether we like it or not, they are a form of unidentified flying object, or UAP, because these things have been seen coming down from the sky. And as the case that happened just a couple weeks ago, the small spheres low the ground, but it accelerates and goes back up into the sky. And, um, and you've got to remember these strange cases I talked about in 1973, the one in September of 73 north of Pittsburgh, where two witnesses were standing out in the country waiting for a friend to pick them up. They see this seven-foot-tall, hair-covered big group with dirty white matted hair running across the road towards the woods. But in one of its hands, it's carrying a small, luminous ball of light. And a short time later, this large object comes across the sky, projects a beam of light down into the woods where the creature ran into. And um, But anyhow, here's, a, here's some details about more and more about what I found out about whatever these things are. They range in size anywhere from a, a, an inch or two up to about a foot or two in diameter. Uh, some of them are just light sources of various colors. The smallest ones look like oversized lightning bugs of fireflies. And I've heard some reports that in some cases we've heard of where there were uh, large numbers of these things moving together like a swarm. And as they're moving, they're illuminating the surrounding area. We've heard that from some of the Bigfoot areas over the, in past years. Um, 
In other cases, they're very commonly they're about a golf ball size to a baseball size, and then a lot of them are around a foot or two in diameter. So in some cases, and very few, but we have a very good case where people have seen it at very close range. I mean, close enough almost in some cases to reach out and touch these things that they're solid metallic. But most of the time, they're just luminous light sources of different colors. And uh, again, they've appeared in daytime as well as at night. We've had instances even in recent uh, weeks where they've come very close to people, I mean, within feet. And I've had cases where these things have hovered and actually kind of cut, uh, touched the uh, windows of homes. I've had them pace vehicles. I've had them enter people's homes and cars through open windows. We've heard reports of these things appearing inside of people's homes and going right through the walls of the house. It is a very, very strange phenomena. And then what's been going on in more recent years is that Many people in areas where there's Bigfoot activity, so both researchers and witnesses, have, be, have begun to report more and more these strange luminous phenomena. So while, again, a lot of them are spherical, in some cases there are some other descriptions I've had. It's not that common, but some of them like kind of elongated like a flare. Um, or sometimes there's odd beams of light coming out of nowhere. And there, there's so many incidents that... Uh, I'm aware of, and, I, and other researchers too, but these reports now are coming in from all over the country, and uh, it's going on more and more, especially in areas where there's a lot of Bigfoot activity around the country. You're hearing more reports of these strange spheres of light, and I've called them mini UFOs for a long time. So um, I'm curious as well, uh, Eric, what is your take on those strange metallic clanks or uh, the the glass, like uh, I think one of you had mentioned, like uh, doing a toast at a wedding, like that kind of a clank. What what is your uh, best guess? Because honestly, like it's going to be hard to pinpoint anything. But what what's your uh, current theory on that? But like, it, it, do you have any, or, or what do you think? I have no idea what what that is. Um, I can tell you. That the night we were there, um, and we were filming actually for an episode of The Ridge from Small Town Monsters, and you can actually see us running around like Keystone Cops. We were just so shaken up by everything that was going on. That night, um, Ricky Cherby was asked to do some whistles to see if we could get a whistle response back. And, and that's when we started, they started hearing the clinking sound. Every time he would do a high pitched whistle, the response would be this single, metallic noise and that's the way that i can only describe it this like clinking or tinking type of noise and they people were calling it wind chimes and i wasn't with the group i was in a separate area with um with seth and um my son and ron murphy and we didn't hear this at first because we were probably a good mile maybe mm, yeah, a little bit over, maybe a little bit over a mile away from the other group so we were just in contact by radio, but when Ricky would do the whistles, we'd hear this metallic, they, I should say they'd hear this metallic tink, and it seemed to be coming from all around them, not just one specific location. And it went on for a while, and after that night, uh, others, including myself, heard the tinking noise or the metallic noise again, but it wasn't as um, uh, long an event as it was that night we first they first heard it in other words um it seemed to go on much longer that first night than it did other nights that we heard it other nights it would just be one or two times that we heard it and we'd all be like hey there's that metallic noise again we'd look around and there'd be no cause for it it would just make that noise um, and it stopped and it didn't continue so what it is where it comes from what what's creating it i have no idea um, there's a couple people that did speculate that it might be coming from something up in the cemetery. So they went up into the cemetery and checked for wind chimes in the cemetery or anything that might be causing that sound, and they could not find anything. Um, and I mentioned that incident happened uh, in recent weeks outside of Ligonier. So this is a rural area that there's been some ongoing things uh, for quite a while. This, again, is early in the morning uh People were awakened by the small sphere, luminous sphere, uh, hovering just a short distance away from their window outside, bopping up and down. But they had been reporting in recent weeks, 
hearing a sound during the night that they couldn't explain. It's a metallic sound, but they said also sound like something was hitting or like a wind chime sound. That's exactly how they described like a wind chime sound. So I thought that's very fascinating. Yeah, this is uh, this is very interesting stuff, guys. Uh, it really sounds like you're all talking about the same thing. Like these witnesses are hearing the same thing you guys are hearing. Um, that just to me screams frequency. There's something there that's that's operating on some kind of a frequency. Yeah, and, and again, there's so much we don't, just don't know what's going on. It's so it's so beyond our understanding right now. A lot of it makes absolutely no sense. But when you have so many credible people describing the same little details, you can't just eliminate it. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Oh, just one thing I wanted to mention uh, in regard to the night uh, back in April when we heard all the tinky sounds and the lights, fears, and all that. The one other thing that happened that night that we really didn't mention, and it only happened briefly, uh, but just prior to the metallic sound starting, several of us did hear what we could only describe as mumbling coming from inside the tree line. It was very soft, very faint. This is nothing new. Eric and I have heard this on, you know, a number of occasions, up at different spots at the ridge. Uh, but there was a few instances that night where we did hear some mumbling sounds, too. Almost like two people talking, but it was so low and muffled you couldn't make out what they were saying. Now, whether that's, you know, has any connection to anything, I don't know. Maybe Stan could you know, elaborate if he's had that type of uh, phenomena occur, you know, at the same times of these spheres of light as well. But I just wanted to mention will, that it was very I will, brief. I will give you had... one, Tom. I will give you one. Right, Joe? And I'm just going to do this because now. To almost, the day. Almost exactly to the time. Yes. Yeah. Because it was at 11.15. Uh, uh, the, the mumbling we had heard from um, 7.30 p.m., on but your your sighting took place at 11 15 or 11 20 yeah but that mumbling though we heard that very early and uh, down in that valley and guys when you hear that i mean it really does it sounds like you can make it out but you can't make it out right i mean that's kind of what and, it's like and we did have recorders with us guys so we tried to record it but the cicadas Crickets. was just overwhelming and uh, all you can hear is that screeing of yeah. the cicadas. <laughs> Unfortunately, we weren't really on an investigation. We were there yeah. to relax. We just and... ha we just happened to have equipment from when we were out the day before. <laughs> a year or two ago in a different part of the ridge, Eric and I both heard some mumbling. And this is an area that's known historically and recently for Bigfoot activity. Uh, you know, we heard the mumbling... Eric had a parabolic microphone. We, we went further into the woods to try mm -hmm. to pinpoint what we were hearing. You know, could it be somebody walking through without a flashlight? We just couldn't see him. You know, we went through. We could. We were picking this up on the parabolic mic, but there was nobody showing up on the flicker. We'd shine the flashlights, or there was nobody anywhere around. Uh, we were the only people there, but it was just it was incredible because we're picking this up on parabolic even with our own ears and you know there's just absolutely nothing there wow hey stan what uh have you had any reports of the uh the mumbling or uh that that sound that they're they're trying to describe as far as with bigfoot and whatnot yeah i actually haven't going back again back many many years back in the 70s talking about vocalizations there were several key vocalizations common during that 73 outbreak one was like a woman in pain screaming, a baby crying, a high-pitched whistle, and like somebody with asthma, like very, very heavy breathing. In fact, I was on a farm and up in the Chestnut Ridge in the dairy side where there were multiple reports for weeks and weeks, and my teams were trying to stake out areas at times, and uh, we got called back to this farm that evening that the creature just been back at the farm, so we took us about a half an hour, we got out to the scene, and the dogs would not make a sound. They wouldn't bark. We saw tracks in the barnyard. It was already dark. They had a big cornfield. There was something bipedal, very heavy, taking big strides away from us, way ahead of us, making this loud, 
very loud, asthmatic-like, heavy breathing sound. I chased it through the cornfield. I recorded the sounds. But whatever it was, I could never catch up to it. But, yeah, over the years, we've learned a lot about the vocalizations. And, and again, they keep continuing to be reported. And what I also learned was because of people who are extremely, I mean, within feet of these creatures and saw this happening, these things could also mimic any type of animal sound or human sounds. And then in more recent years, we're hearing more reports of what people are describing as uh, unintelligible words or something like monkey chatter. Yep. Yeah, that that was similar to what Ron and I had experienced a year ago um, when we were, uh, or, or was it two years ago? It was two years ago, Bob. Yeah, it was two years ago now. Because so we were, yeah, we were trying to uh, chill out while the world was going crazy, as I recall. Yep. And um, this, it, it was one of those things where it sounded like two people trying to have a conversation with marbles in their mouth. Very high pitched. We we, and, we said it was kind of a female. Yeah, sound. one one right. sounded female. The one that was the farthest off sounded female, and the one that was closest to us did not sound female. It was weird. Yeah, it was a very very odd night. That's yeah, for sure. It was an and odd the, night. The one the the one was mimicking my son's crying to a T. To like to the point where we were going and checking on him while he was asleep three and, times. Um thinking that he was crying because it had mimicked his cry perfectly. And this is, this is up at our farm. We've got a house up there and, uh, it wasn't the first time that Rowan had been there. And so whatever was there had heard Rowan crying previously. No, well, probably. Yeah. And, and what's uh, really weird about the crying thing, Joe, is I did not hear the crying out of four people, three people heard the crying. I did not hear that crying. That's the weird part. But I did hear the weird vibration or hum or, or whatever yes. that was that put you on your knees. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that I did hear. And, uh, you know, that reverberation sound. I've talked to many people after this. And, man, I hear the same thing over and over again. Yeah, that's kind of what it sounds like. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? No. Yep. So it, it was it's like a hive of bees flying around in yeah. a drum. Yeah, it's kind of what you, yeah, exactly, uh, in the distance. Yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, it really seems like we are hearing the exact same thing that you guys are getting in your area down here. Uh, again, I was. What's really funny today? We were at. Uh, we went to an antique mall in Nitro. Went to uh, Browns, and uh, the owners were there. We got to talk to the owners, and uh, they were really nice. And and one of them was uh, very interested in Bigfoot. By the way, like extremely interested in Bigfoot. They they may be coming to uh, Mothman Festival to hear us talk. By the way, they were awesome. They, they were impressed, <laughs> and um, she had uh, had talked about you know uh, talking to people who had had these encounters and wanted to know well you know is it what do you think you know are they are they real and I'm like well there's something there because we're getting so much data from all these different places and it's really the same stuff. We're hearing the same stuff. You're talking about the the lights, Joe. You saw the lights when you were yeah. you were out there, Jesse. You've seen the lights. Uh, like I said, everyone's seen the lights but me. But you know, I have seen other things, so I'm okay. I'm good. But uh, we're talking about something that is, to me, very real. It's not imagined. This is not an imagined thing. And one thing I do want to touch, guys. Because you know the skeptics are always the skeptics. We're not really ever going to explain away any. We're not going to give them anything. They're always going to try to explain it away. You know this. Uh, so we're not trying to change anyone's mind. This is just what we've all witnessed. But can you say that you know that those those lights, those illuminations that you saw, those were not somebody. Those were not other people. I mean, that were out there messing around. Yes. To the best of your knowledge. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Not a doubt. When we arrived, there was no other vehicles there. We were the only ones in that section of woods. Um, as Tom mentioned earlier, that road that we're on is pitch dark. And there is a ravine to our left that's very hard to navigate, even when it's not thick with foliage. And it's thick with foliage and brush and briars really difficult to move around in so if there were people up there and there are people that go in that area from time to time we've heard them we had somebody drive by us when we were investigating one night in a car of all things and it's very difficult to get up there in a car but somebody did it so people are up in that area but that particular night and 
several of the other nights we've experienced things, there was no one else out there. We would have heard them. We would have seen lights in the woods, flashlights moving around. We, I mean, we would have been able to rule that out pretty easily. Yeah. But there was nobody else around. So I, I have no explanation for it. I can't say that the, the two are related, but hearing Stan's cases for the years that I've known him, and, and I've known Stan almost what, 35 years now, yeah. hearing his cases, investigating with Stan, um, experiencing these lights for myself on multiple occasions in several different locations throughout the state, um, there's something to the phenomenon. Whether or not it's related to Bigfoot or not, I can't say. But it's awfully odd that there's Bigfoot activity going on in this area, along with these lights showing up almost exactly at the same time or shortly after or before the Bigfoot activity happens. And you guys have proof. I mean, I've sent you audio recordings that you analyzed and looked at that we captured yeah. from this area. So you yeah, guys let's know talk, what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's that's talk about that's that. what I was getting ready to ask you about. Yeah. If you had uh, wanted to talk about that before we wrapped up the show this evening. Um Sure. Like maybe we can close out with that one. Uh, so tell us, tell us what you guys, what had you out there in that area uh, the night that you were getting those recordings, and then we can talk about the recordings after that. Sure. Well, um, as I was mentioning, we've been investigating this area almost on a weekly basis. Um, sometimes we go up there two or three nights a week. Usually it's the weekends, Friday, Saturday, you know, Friday or Saturday. And this particular night. Um, I got a call from uh, one of the team members asking if I would be interested in heading up there. And of course, I had nothing going on. So I said, sure. Got a hold of Tom and we all decided to go up and, and investigate. And I think that night it was Tom, myself, um, two other members of the team, Chris and Connie, and um, their son, Josh, and my son, Josh. And my son's just starting to get into this. So he always likes to tag along. But when we arrived on Friday evening, this was the very beginning of July, just the weekend of the 4th of July. So it was like the 3rd and 4th. And when we arrived Friday evening, no sooner we just backed our vehicles into this little clearing where we park our trucks. I stepped out of my truck and I began to hear this howl. And it sounded like, it sounded like a dog. It would bark and then it would, it would howl. And this was going on for almost 45 minutes to an hour. And it wasn't solicited. We weren't, we weren't, doing anything to cause this dog to bark and howl. It was just doing it. And it was coming from a ravine across the little roadway from us. And it would, it would do it every, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes, five minutes, but it would bark and it would howl or it would howl and it would bark. And we tried doing wood knocks. We tried doing calls. Um, we tried yelling, just us talking, trying to get this animal to either move closer to us or away from us or just to respond to us. And it seemed like it was oblivious to us completely because it just kept doing this bark and howl. And at one point, I even mentioned, um, and you probably heard on the recording, I was like, is that a, another Bigfoot group out here or is there somebody else out here? Because yeah. it sounded like it was recorded. It was that loud, that close, and that clear. And we were like, well, if there was another group out here, they, they'd have to be in that ravine. And that ravine is very difficult to get down into that ravine. But regardless, um, this noise went on for almost 45 minutes and I had enough time from when I started hearing it to get my parabolic mic set up and I have a um, I have a super bionic ear that I use that, that's run into a zoom um, h2n digital recorder and I have it on a tripod so I had that set up and I had a zoom h4n pro that I set up um, to record as well so we were capturing from two different sources there and Chris had his cell phone out. He actually captured some of the sounds on his cell phone. It was that clear and that close. Um, we all as a collective group came to the conclusion it had to be some kind of dog, maybe a coyote. Somebody dropped the dog off in the middle of the woods and it wandered down in this ravine. It got stuck in a trap or possibly it was another Bigfoot research group or people out there doing calls that just you know, weren't responding to us. They just kept doing these calls over and over again. But eventually the calls faded away far enough that it just stopped. So we thought it was kind of odd, but we had all these recordings of all these sounds from Friday night. Um, the, Connie and Chris, the two researchers that were with us and their son had to leave, so they left and Tom and I remained behind. And Tom and I heard, um, we heard some coyotes howling in the distance, a pack of them 
yelping and barking. But then at the end of those, we heard two long drawn out howls. And these were pretty close to us as well. Um, unfortunately, I had by that time packed up most of my gear and we were getting ready to leave ourselves. So we didn't hear, we didn't catch that on, on recording, but we got the coyote sounds on recording, which we sent to you, Joe, and you of course yeah. analyzed them and they came back as coyote. Um, Saturday, when we got there Saturday in the evening, the same situation almost verbatim happened again. We weren't more than two or three minutes outside of our parked trucks and the sound was coming from the ravine it was very similar to what we captured on Friday night, what we heard, but it was different. It was higher pitched. It was a completely different animal and it didn't sound like a canine. It sounded like something mocking a canine or trying to mock a canine, very high pitched howl. And again, it wasn't solicited. We tried knocks. I tried doing the Ohio howl call, broadcasting with the digital call blaster I have. Nothing could get this animal to stop making the calls or to respond to us. It just continued to do it. And we thought it was kind of strange, but it continued to make these sounds. And it went on for, I guess, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes again, before it finally just stopped. And it didn't fade away like the other sounds from Friday night, just like, it, like an animal moved off into the distance. This just quit. And we were kind of puzzled as to what the heck these sounds were. Um, I've heard sounds like that before, but never that close. That high volume, it was so loud that, that the recordings don't do it justice. And it, it sounded like they were literally coming from the ravine right down the hill from us, maybe 100 yards away. And um, once we, once that animal moved, we had no other sounds that night, no other knocks, no whoops, no nothing. Um, once the howls ended, they ended, and there was no other noise. So I sent those recordings on to you to have you analyze them, take a listen to them, get you guys your feedback and thoughts and see what you thought about them. Because I had a pretty much a pretty good idea of what they were Friday night and what they were Saturday night. But I wanted a second opinion, a second set of ears, if you will, and someone to run them through a spectrograph or at least give us an analyzation, see what you, you thought of them. So that's when I sent them off to you to have you analyze them. And uh, the one that I personally found the most interesting, um, which this is something that, you know, now, now that I... It, I almost hate to say it out loud on on uh, on the radio here, but it, it's one of those things that is a signature that that I like to try to look at on these spectrographs is um, just before a call is made, there is a vertical pitch that shows up. And that vertical pitch is the same exact signature that you will always see if you perform a test knock or if somebody has recorded a knock out in the woods that, has, uh, that was unsolicited by you um, when you were just out walking about and you get a knock out of nowhere. This is it looks identical. Um, and oftentimes that knock is immediately followed up with a long drawn out howl. And that is exactly what you got. Now, for you guys, the knock was inaudible. Uh, it actually does not show up, or well, it shows up visually on on uh, Sonic Visualizer. You can see it, but you can't actually hear it. The frequency was so low that you cannot hear it. Um, but it took it happened. It was farther away than what your howling subject was is basically what it's reading and telling you. Um, so was is what we're seeing, is this a call and response in the form of a knock followed by a howl? Uh, we, we don't know, but it's something that I have seen on a ton of possible or alleged Sasquatch, Bigfoot, wild man calls that, uh, that are out there that you can get the audio samples from, or if you contact anybody and get samples of their audio. Um, that one to me was the most interesting because it did have that, that signature that I, I personally like to see because it, uh, there, there's no, there's nothing that's going to replicate that on top of that. The frequencies from night two were on a totally different level. Um, they were a much longer drawn out droning tone and the uh, there was no what I call a whimpering drop off, which is what you see in coyote calls. 
Uh, when you're looking at them through Sonic Visualizer, there's going to be this staggered stair stepping that takes place at the very end of the call. It's nothing necessarily that you can actually audibly hear, but when it runs through the frequency, it, it you can see this just stair, staggered stepping down. And um, with this call, it was it, it just faded out into nothing. It was smooth as silk, and it just faded out. And um, those those were two of the most interesting things of note for me. Now there were a couple other of these uh, guest vocalizers uh that that I, as I like to call them because we don't know what they are uh but they're not a coyote it's not a cow uh, it's not another canine of any sort so this uh there were three other instances other than those two of this guest vocalizer that that I'm quite confident are the target you were after that night um and, and we had talked about that and uh, I think you'd use that in a presentation as well um so have in that is is all of this other stuff taking place in that exact same area? Yep. Wow. Yep. That same exact clearing where they heard, heard the metal tinking sounds where 50 yards, 100 yards up the road, that road connects to that little clearing right below the cemetery. And the howls took place in the ravine just down the hill from the set, that little clearing. The lights took place 100 yards up the road from that clearing. It's all centered around this clearing for some reason we've got to get up there at some point and just throw everything at it everything literally everything yeah yeah I think Our, unfortunately for us well i should say fortunately for us and unfortunately for us um the couple of occasions where we've seen the lights the first time we had camera crews professional camera crews with good cameras capture these lights so there is visual proof that the lights were there the second time that tom and i saw them on the road we weren't prepared. I just had a flashlight in my hand, and in my, I think in my other hand I had my um, my squatch knocker, <laughs> and that was it. Um, I wasn't ready for seeing lights, and we didn't capture them. But um, now we're looking at possibly putting out some kind of camera system to set and let run yeah. while we're there, hopefully catching some of these lights. We're just trying to figure out a power source that we can mm -hmm. make this work, kind of like a DVR system when you do paranormal investigating, but setting something like that up in the woods. I know game cameras might be a good option, but I don't know how well they're going to capture what we have out there. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but we're looking into a couple of different things at this point to try to put out there to try to capture these light sources. But we've captured the audio, so that I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, yeah. We're just going to keep going back and investigating, see what happens. I, I think having that uh, that stuff on film as well is extremely valuable, um, just because it's the the first time that I'm aware of that that phenomena has actually been caught on camera and was on a publicly consumable um, format. And it was, it was not just a single uh, camera point, you know, it, right. There were multiple captures and it, it, you, what do you, you, you can't, you can't write that one off at that point. Um, and well, then with the, uh, with with what when we're saying throw everything at it, we want I want to get scientific instrumentation up there and yeah, get get we, measurements and readings yeah, as and we talked about that to really uh, dive in yeah yeah for sure yeah, because there's still a lot of skeptics and there's still a lot of people that are saying these yeah. are insects these yeah. are lightning bugs oh yeah um, but if we can get something up there environmental right? phenomenon yeah but if we can get something up there that that has multiple validation points, then you're going to have to explain to me how a lightning bug is given off EMF or whatever else. Right. So right. I think that's going to be, uh, that's going to be the plan is just to try to just throw everything in it. Like, like Joe said, I mean, I uh, think if I could that, throw this in there real quick. Um, the night that we heard the howls on Saturday, I had an EMF radiation detector that stand low in me and we had spikes on the EMF and radiation detector. Um, the EMF was over four, yeah. and it lasted for a good 10 minutes before it stopped. The base reading was zero, oh, yeah. and we took base readings prior to using it. When we walked over to the edge of the ravine, it spiked at four, and I believe the other one jumped up to 14 or 16. And after 10 minutes, it dissipated. It was gone. and never happened again. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 
Absolutely. And I can, I can absolutely validate that uh, and follow up with, I have been in areas in the woods where it should be zero and had these strange, uh, just weird anomalous things happen. Um, I've got those on video. I don't know what they mean. But if we can find uh, enough of those uh, and we can look at them a, a little more, you know, uh, I guess with a fine tooth comb, so to speak, and find all of these different correlations, we have to say something's causing this. There's a cause and effect, right? I mean, that's what it really comes down to. If we can find a pattern. That's, yeah, the pattern. Then then we're, we're looking there. Because I know Jesse has recorded these things as well. Oh yeah, I use I have a I have Geiger counter. I have you know the EMF. Um, I have equipment to test you know radio signals. I have uh, working on some infrasound and uh, ultrasound type equipment right now. So yeah, I have a, a few things to uh, input information. I think you might find of interest if you have time. We have time. Yeah. Okay. One. Well, a couple of things. One, you talk about the correlation between the Bigfoot and these spheres of light. So here's an interesting case I was involved in. This was May of 2019. This was a rural area outside of Pittsburgh. There's been uh, a number of incidents uh, over in this area over the last few years that I've heard reports on, but it was early morning and this man happened to wake up. He's looking out his window. So his window faces the backyard, which is well illuminated, and then it goes into a wooded area. He sees a small Bigfoot, about four and a half to five feet tall, covered with long, dark hair, it's walking uh, upright on two legs. You can see the very long arms moving as it's uh, swinging as it's moving. And it enters a particular area of the woods, and then it's gone. Within three seconds, at that exact location where the creature entered, a bright sphere of light about three to four inches in diameter suddenly appears. And um, that sphere of light was only about four feet off the ground, and it disappeared a few seconds later, it reappeared again, and this time it emitted a beam of light about 10 to 12 feet long, and then it went out a few seconds later, and that was the end of it. But there was that's a pretty good direct correlation. Um, also, I can tell you, in more recent years, the reports I'm getting of vocalizations are getting stranger. I'm hearing more reports of very long vocalizations made up of various different animal sounds that are all connected. They just change from one to another. One of the vocalizations that people are talking more about is what sounds like a large oversized owl. And I think it may be Eric or somebody has mentioned this as well in the past. That's interesting. And then you mentioned about the baby crying sounds. And of course, that's one of the key sounds we've heard of for years. And uh, I remember one case in particular during that 73 outbreak it was at a cemetery uh, right on the right on the edge of the ridge outside of Lake Tropier, uh, this woman and I believe it was a three-year-old child were down in the in the cemetery putting on flowers on a grave, and the mother was watching the child walking around I think maybe 20, 25 feet away, and began to hear these baby crying sounds and didn't pay much attention to it. Uh, she thought the sounds originally were coming from over the hill from a house, and then a few minutes later she hear these louder baby crying sounds and her, her baby's starting to cry and she looks up and just I'm, I'm guessing again from the report I'd have a look I think it was like 10 15 feet away right in the edge of the woods here's this huge hairy Bigfoot looking directly at the baby that's making these baby crying sounds and it slowly is starting to walk in that direction so the mother runs over and grabs the child jumps in the car with the baby and gets out of there so here's the interesting part of the story uh she goes to her dad's farm about five miles away. Within the hour, the same or another Bigfoot shut up at that farm. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's pretty remarkable stuff. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about these things. You guys know as well as I do uh, my whole uh, thing with Bigfoot. You know, up until a few years ago when I got drug into this, uh, I just thought, well, that's a really cool legend. And yeah, it's probably real, but I didn't have any actual, what I would call proof. Still have actual proof, okay? Let's just say that. But for me, there's enough proof here to say that there's definitely something going on. Um, and it, it's just, what you look at it, you can't look away. There's something there. 
And I know we look at it in different light than some of these other guys. We, like Joe says, we throw everything at it, you know. Well, that's my fault. And that's, uh, I don't apologize for it. Because, yeah, that, that is your fault. Um, well, I don't apologize I, for it. I, 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 I do still, not. I still sit in in a different camp, I think, than than some others entirely, just because it's yeah. there's there's more to, in my eyes. There's a lot more to it than uh, than just one, two, or maybe even three different things. So. We don't know what it is, but it's almost yep. like the UAP phenomena. There's probably multiple explanations for this phenomena and these sightings that people are having. I mean, that's kind of the way I see it anyway. But you all know, when we have these things and these incidents, like particularly that sighting that we had, the first thing we do is we start reaching out to you guys. We reach out to, you know, for peer review. Uh, I know I immediately got a hold of Stan and was, wanted to know, you know, make sure I wasn't going crazy. So, uh, you know, these are these are things that uh, that we try to do to 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 kind of explain to ourselves, I guess, before we try to even manage to explain to anyone else what's going on. So what, uh, what's the future hold? I think that's going to be the next question. So, uh, where, where do you go? Yeah. Where do you go, uh, with this from, from here forward, Eric? That, that is a good question. Um, we're going to continue to, to monitor this area. And, um, like I said, we're hopefully going to bring in some kind of camera system to set up and try to capture these lights. I mean, it's great that uh, Small Town Monsters was able to um, capture these sound or these lights, I should say, and um, show them. But unfortunately, they only show them for a brief period of time. They don't show the entire investigation. And due to editing, there's a lot that was left out. So we, we're hoping that we can put up some kind of light system and... Um, capture more of these light phenomenon that's going on up there. I don't know if we're going to be able to explain it, but at least we'll have some visual possible proof, if you want to call it that, um, so people can see what we're talking about. And I think it's necessary that we do have um, some scientific tools brought in to try to measure the environmental conditions um, to see if there's radiation, uh, EMF, anything that we can find that might be causing these light anomalies. It might be something environmental. It might be something atmospheric. We just don't know at this point. Um, could it be Bigfoot related? Could it be all just one big coincidence? Who knows? At this point, we just, we're just we trying to throw whatever we can at the wall and see what sticks. Absolutely. Tom, I know that you've had a background in, uh, like me, with paranormal activity and whatnot. Uh, so I think that throwing a little bit of that at it you're, you're kind of doing what I do with Joe, basically, is what I'm saying. So I think throwing a little bit of that at it and and kind of looking at it with those kind of uh, lenses gives you a little bit different perspective on it as well, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, Stan has said before, and Eric, and you know any of us who do this, you got to keep an open mind. Uh, um, saying these fears of light are directly connected to Bigfoot or anything else, no, but you can't deny that they're happening. You know, the data is there and you have to go where the data takes you. So, you know, I've never, I've never been one to connect Bigfoot with the paranormal, but when you have these phenomena all happening within the same, you know, small area, I mean, like I said, you just can't ignore it. You know, but one thing I did want to say real quick, tagging on to what Eric said earlier on about, you know, there were some, uh, you know, as far as the spheres and the, the filming and there have been some negative uh, feedback and people don't believe. We're not trying to convince anybody of that particular thing. We're out there collecting and displaying the data. Uh, everybody can make up their own mind what it is. And, you know, Eric had mentioned that there have been some negative feedback on the Ridge series and the lights and, you know, just different things that saying that, oh, it's this or it's that. The bottom line is, it, it, it's just my own personal opinion. The paranormal, cryptozoology, it, it's all a personal field. And what I mean is, it doesn't matter what evidence you put out there regarding UFOs, Bigfoot, ghosts, or anything. 
there's always going to be somebody out there that says that's you know that's cgi yep. that's uh you know that picture's photoshop you know at this point if you do put a big foot on the table too so there's really no way to convince the world or to prove to the world that this is real what it comes down to is personal experience again you're in this to get rich or to be famous so the bottom line is we're just trying to satisfy our own passion and our own uh questions or you know whatever the case and really that's just the way i approach it so you know, when other people come out and, and you have naysayers putting these comments on or, or you know, saying this is fake, that's fake. My only question to them is, how often are you out in the woods? Where's your evidence? Where's your body of work, right? Yeah, I, that's exactly. So, yeah, I and, get you. And, you know, the group of people that in the, in the PBS, Eric, Stan, you know, these are top-notch legitimate well-respected highly credible researchers so bottom line is we just do what we do and that is there you make out of it what you want say it joe you're done you're done to say it joe what what what's the data say what do you say the data doesn't care about your feelings so (laughs) whatever is out there whatever you're collecting it all goes on the table it doesn't matter what your preconceived notions are that is that has been our our one of our mission statements from day uh, one from the time yeah. we started so you guys are are doing it right up there um and and we appreciate all of the work you guys are doing we appreciate you guys coming on the show with us tonight and going over this stuff absolutely um, um stan what's what's new in your world and what can we expect next before we uh before we hit the button well again there's been it's just been ongoing i mean for the last few weeks and months Right through the last couple of weeks, I've been ongoing UFO sightings. I mean, we've had some very interesting, very detailed, very large objects low to the ground. Uh, we had an interesting report. I interviewed uh, the man uh, more than once, uh, who several weeks ago, he and his son were riding across the bridge down near Elizabeth, down the Mon Valley outside of Pittsburgh. They observed this huge triangular object hovering about 200 feet over the Mon River. And as they watch this thing, they, they couldn't – they had to slow down, but they couldn't stop because they were on the bridge. They had to keep moving. And they said two of the points of the triangle, it was so big, it extended and covered to both sides of the river. And they could see this thing uh, moving sideways, uh, back and forth, uh, changing position. It was hovering there. And uh, so we've had other reports of triangular objects and rectangular objects and spherical objects and then daylight reports coming in as well as at night. Uh, and again, very interestingly, are this increase in reports of these small spherical objects, very low to the ground, coming very close to people, even in daylight in some cases, plus the night reports. And again, some of these reports are in more populated areas, not near the woods. So I've been looking at these cases for years and years. And as you know, we talked about this in past shows. I found a lot of data now, and I wrote about this years and years ago, which suggests and I believe me, this is something I wasn't looking for. My teams were not looking for. These are the cases that came to our attention that we're dealing with a Bigfoot phenomena that is so strange. There's a physical and a non-physical component to it. For lack of a better term, I think we're dealing with something that's interdimensional. And when I talk about some of these cases with UFOs and Bigfoot seen together, I'm not saying that these things are extraterrestrial or that these creatures are flying around the spaceship or another planet because we don't know for sure what the UFOs are. I said years ago, there's very likely more than one origin to the unknown category of the UFO mystery. And I think we're going to continue to see these reports. These reports are coming in now from all over the country and around the world, similar reports. And uh, I think uh, as more time goes on and more scientific studies being done, hopefully we'll get more data. I think right now we're dealing with something that is far beyond our present scientific understanding. And maybe someday we'll have some answers, but I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Absolutely agree with that. Absolutely agree with that. Stan, I want to thank you for coming on the show with us once again. I couldn't think of anyone better to be in a part of this panel. This has been an amazing discussion. The Chestnut Ridge is uh, possibly one of the most mysterious places within our little 
you know, realm of uh, existence here. You know, it's not that far away. We're only about uh, three hours away, something like that, from where we actually are. So, uh, all definitely, the more reason for you guys to get down here. Don't worry, we're we're planning on it. We have to we have to bring a few toys with us when we do that. Absolutely. Well, guys, thanks for coming on tonight. Mm -hmm. It's been a blast. Uh, it's been a good conversation. Special thanks to Stan Gordon and Tom and Eric. You guys are awesome. We really appreciate all of you guys and everything you're doing up there on the ridge. Before we do the weekly shakedown and, and take it home, um, proof that you guys are listening. Oh, I want to hear this. It. It worked, Ron. Okay, let's hear <laughs> it. Number one was dethroned. <laughs> so Sherwood Park, Alberta, Canada. You guys were number one in downloads last week. Ooh, you got the whoopings put on you. They you came did. out of nowhere. Everybody was listening. You went from number one to number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. What? You went to number eleven from position polling <laughs> position to out of the top ten in one week. But number two is is from last week. You guys spread the word. You kept it rolling, and you overtook the polling position. You Seattle, tell me Seattle Washington. just won it. Seattle, Seattle Washington took it home this Way week. To go, Seattle. Good job, guys. Thanks to every one of you guys who are listening out there in Seattle, Washington, sharing it with your friends. Oh, and number two was, I think, the most improved because number this week's number two was last week's number 15. And uh, that is Frederick, Maryland. You guys are are actually pretty close to us uh, and where we're all recording here in comparison to Seattle, Washington. Um, so thank you guys for listening. And then for our abroad category, Denmark won this week. Denmark. Denmark took it home. <laughs> okay. And with number two being the UK. So uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you all for downloading and listening and watching on YouTube everywhere that you're catching all this stuff. We greatly appreciate it. That said, Jesse, you Jesse. know what to do. It's been too long. <laughs> Joe, I heard you were just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yes. that's what everybody said. <laughs> yes. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. It was really fun to listen to uh, all of these examples of all of this multi-phenomenon going on. This is something that I'm really looking into right now and that I'm super fascinated with. It's awesome to see that more researchers are experiencing all of this layering of phenomenon. And I think this is all gonna just keep increasing as things seem to be ramping up. But as always, we're gonna take you out here. Make sure that you like, share, subscribe, and download the episode because that gets us higher in the numbers. We appreciate you so much for being our viewers and our listeners every single week. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at HellbentJesse. You can find my videos at Hellbent Holler on YouTube. You can go to my website, HellbentHoller.com, and check out all the going on with my new project dark dive and all of my latest videos that are coming out we've got more lbl stuff coming out more episodes of dark dive and more investigations in general we're going out in the woods every weekend and uh we're we're on there just like these guys here tom and eric and stan are doing the work we're doing the work and that's the important thing uh it's very important that you follow people and support people who actually go out there in the woods and do the work so we appreciate you guys. I know they appreciate you guys. And make sure you support their work and um, watch anything to do with the Chestnut Ridge because it's insanely fascinating. You can follow Ron at Lanham Ron on Instagram. You can follow Joe at Skinwalker Sculpts. And make sure that you go to wildandweirdwv.com to check out all of the new stuff that's coming up. The most important thing that's coming up right now is Wild and Weird Con in Logan, West Virginia. It's going to be at Chief Logan State Park in October, October 13th and 14th. That night before, I will be doing a special expedition with all of my equipment. If you come and you sign up, you go in there, you're going to go out in the woods with me. You get to do hands-on 
You had to go hands-on with all of my equipment, including all three of my thermals. I have, uh, I have, I have thermals. I have night vision. I have all kinds of good stuff. Parabolic microphones. I have literally like ten thousand dollars worth of equipment <laughs> that you get to go and check out and play with. Multiple and, uh, cases. Multiple hard there cases. Are multiple cases. Yes, I think I have. <laughs> I think I have like close to 15 grand in equipment. So I'm going to have all of that out there for you to check out and play around with and see how it works. So make sure you check that out. Sign up for that. Join me for that night hike the night before. And then the next day I'll be speaking at the convention. So um, I know the guys are going to be at the Mothman Festival coming up. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Yep, we will okay. be at the Mothman Festival. We are speaking on Saturday. Yeah, at 4 p.m., I believe. At, yeah, it's 3 30, 3.40 or 4 p.m., something like that. It's it's that time frame, that slot. Download the Mothman app. It will tell you exactly yep. when we are, and that way you won't miss anything. And again, we want to thank Eric, Tom, and Stan for joining us tonight. You guys are awesome. We appreciate it, and we hope we can have this conversation again. Fellas. And remember, if you are out in the woods and you see a ball of light, followed by the clinking, tinkling sounds of metal. Don't follow it. You might disappear forever. Or it might just be us out there trying to find some stuff. Stay wild and weird, everybody.